Good morning, everyone. Today we uh, come to Psalm 88, and it's a prayer, but it's a prayer I hope that you never have to, to pray. Uh, it's called the granddaddy of all laments. Another commentator said it's the darkest corner of the Psalter. Uh, if you've ever heard the expression, the dark night of the soul, uh, it would be an apt uh, description for Psalm 88. What makes this Psalm unique is that it's the only lament that doesn't have some expression of trust. You know, oftentimes the psalmist is, is pouring his complaints out to God. He's ventilating all his negative emotions. But in the midst of it, he'll, he'll say, but Lord, even, you know, even though I can't trace you, I'm going to trust you. But there's none of that in Psalm 88. It's, it's all darkness all the time. Heman the Ezraite is uh, said to be the author, and uh, Heman knew suffering. He, he knew darkness. Uh, you see this come out in a number of ways in the psalm. There are three Hebrew words that are translated cry, and each one of those words are, are used. Um, they're also uh, connected to three chronological references um, in, in, in which he says, for instance, in, in verse 1, uh, I call out at night. In verse 9, I call out every day. And uh, in verse 13, I call out in the morning. In other words, uh, every possible moment, it's all darkness. It's, it's, it's all the time. It's unrelenting. You see this mood of misery captured also in just the number of times it refers to death with, you know, just about every word you could come up with for, for death. Um, let me give you a quick sampling. Uh, verse 3, death. Verse 4, the pit. Uh, verse 5, dead. Uh, verse 5 again, the grave. Verse 6, the lowest pit. Uh, uh, verse 6, the darkest depth. Uh, verse 10, dead. Verse 11, grave. Uh, verse 11 again, Abaddon, which is the Hebrew word for destruction. And then in verse 12, the place of darkness and the place of oblivion, or could actually be translated forgetfulness, but you get the, you get the idea. Um, he's got a preoccupation here with death because life is just that bad. Just about the time you think it couldn't get any worse, it does. Uh, you, you, you begin to see that the, the psalmist is not only feeling the pain of all this misery, but he thinks God is the one that's responsible for it. Um, for instance, in verses uh, 6 uh, and 7, he says, Your wrath, God, lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. And then he says, you have taken away from me my closest friends and have made them repulsive to me. In other words, not only are you responsible for my troubles, but you've taken away my support system. Um, you, you just, uh, you know, can't get it any worse than, than that. Reminds me of the story of uh, Joe and Mary Lou Bailey. Joe, Joe Bailey used to write for Eternity Magazine. He had a beautiful family, young family. And uh, then one day tragedy struck. Uh, his uh, five-year-old boy developed leukemia and died. Um, shortly after that, Mary Lou became pregnant, and they thought, oh, this was just God's, uh, you know, God's blessing to give them a new life for the life that they had lost. But when the day for young John's birth came, uh, he had a severe uh, handicap. The second day of his life, he died. Now, a few years later, their 18-year-old son, Joe Jr., uh, was in a sledding accident. He happened to be a hemophiliac, and he ended up bleeding to death. Think about that for just a second. Seven years, three sons, three sons, all of them died. And in the aftermath of that, Joe Bailey wrote these words, Leave me alone, Lord. You've taken from me what I'd give your world. I cannot see such waste that you should take what poor men need. Have mercy, Lord. Here is my quick claim. Joe Bailey was saying, I'm, I'm cashing in my chips, Lord. I'm done. I'm quitting. And that's what often happens when people go through that dark night of a soul, when they begin to experience Psalm 88. Now let's ask ourselves the question, what, what can we learn from a psalm like this? I want to suggest two things. Number one, uh, the Bible reflects reality. It, it just rings true to the experience of uh, many believers down through history who have wrestled with God um, uh, with, with these 
profound questions of, you know, God, where are you in the midst of my pain? Why haven't you answered my prayer? Why haven't you rescued me? Uh, think of Job. Think of Habakkuk. Think of the writer of Ecclesiastes. Think of Jesus as he's on the cross, his arms outstretched, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, it was that perceived absence of God. That's the theme that seems to run through this book. Um, one of the things that I appreciate about the Bible is that it doesn't delete a song like this. Um, it, it tells us that it's okay to question God in the midst of our pain. That we don't have to put on a fake smile. We don't have to, you know, sing like Bobby McFerrin, uh, don't worry, be, be happy. J.I. Packer, who just died this past week, one of our favorite theologians at the grand old age of 93, said something very significant. He said, the only glimmer of hope in this dark psalm is that the psalmist is still praying. He's still clinging. He, he might be mad at God. He might be at sorts with God, but he's still praying. He's still clinging on to God in the hopes that maybe he will be able to praise again. Here's a second lesson, and I think this is one that can only be understood in, in light of the New Testament. Uh, God joins us in our suffering. God doesn't, in the comfort of heaven, sort of turn a deaf ear to the pain that's going on in this fallen world. You see, God knows pain. He subjected himself to it on our behalf. He gave his own son. He gave his only son on our behalf to be tortured and to be killed. And as a father, you can only imagine the pain that it caused the father to see what was happening to his son. Jesus knew that kind of pain. God knows our pain because he himself has entered into it. That's one of the, I think, one of the most attractive things about the, the Christian faith is that God actually understands our pain because he's entered into it. Ben Weir was a, a, a Presbyterian missionary. He was uh, taken hostage in the 1980s in Lebanon. He uh, was asked upon his release after suffering his own dark night of the soul, uh, Ben, how did you deal with that horrendous situation and, and what would you suggest to people who might find themselves in a similar situation? His, his answer was interesting. He said, I would encourage them to memorize Psalm 88. He said, that grand old Hebrew well was more cathartic than anything I found. 